suspense and we're here at the St. Petersburg Grand Prix to learn about the STEM of racing. In our district, we are focusing on STEM education, getting the kids involved in STEM careers. How is STEM involved in what you do every single day? Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot of technology involved in racing and, uh, you know, for us uh, race car drivers, we rely a lot on, on the technology to do its thing and, and do it well. And uh, there's a lot of, obviously, young kids that come to events like this and see what racing's all about and, uh, and then they get into engineering and then next thing you know, they become team members and, you know, high-end mechanics and, and engineers and, uh, and, yeah, help us make those cars faster. You ready? My name is Dalton Kellett. I drive the number 67 Kellett in Insiders USA and 1080, 1080 Education Indy Lights car with Pink Coast Racing. Uh, I myself, I'm an, I have an engineering degree, so I love anything we can do to use racing to promote STEM and get out there and kind of spread that message. And specifically, what I do as the driver is, you know, I obviously drive the race car, but then I take the feedback that I feel how the car is handling and all that, and relay that to my engineers. So we're always working with. STEM professionals, whether it's race engineers, mechanics, engine engineers, all there's a, a lot of STEM work that goes on to make the race car go fast. Basically what we're going to do here is we're going to take the settings that the engineers have come up with the springs and suspension and all that. The mechanics are going to use our reference pad and set, set the car up for the track here. So it's a bumpy track, we're going to have a little more ride height, softer springs and all that. We actually come and look at the car. The first thing you notice with these cars, we have wings, un un unlike most road cars. What that does, it's basically an inverted air airfoil, so it produces downforce, not you know, lift in a downward direction. Um, so it's like an airplane flipped upside down. And that, yeah, and, and that basically presses the car down onto the ground, increases the normal force of the contact patch without, without adding weight, so you don't add inertia to, to the car. That lets you corner faster. What's the exterior of your car made out of? So the whole car, the whole chassis, the tub, the, all the bodywork, the panels, the wings, it's all made out of uh, carbon fiber, so mm -hmm. it's a composite material. So you have the lightweight and stiffness that you'd get with, say, aerospace grade aluminum, but you also have the impact resistance of a, a polymer with the epoxy that's used to bond the fibers together. Uh, so it's very tough, but also very light. Um, and the suspension is made out of a uh, steel alloy that's welded. You can see the joints there. And so for both us and IndyCar, all the suspension components are either steel or aluminum. The uprights are machined aluminum. Um, the covers are carbon fiber. We also have, see here, we have safety tethers on the wheel made out of Kevlar. So if the, say, if, if this, if all these pieces break, this strap it will still attach to the car by a hard, on a hard point, and that'll keep the wheel from flying off. And then the side of the car, this the black uh, carbon fiber piece here, is called the underwing. So if you were to section kind of the middle of the side pod in, 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 in a side view, you'd actually see a big airfoil. So the whole underside of the car is one big kind of venturi tunnel shape. And as the air goes in that kind of swoopy section there, it accelerates under the car, gets ejected under the wing, and that creates, the, as the air accelerates along that path, it creates, creates suction, which then pulls the car down onto the ground. So it's basically an, another wing. Welcome back to Science Rocks. I'm Laura Spence. We're learning about the STEM of racing here at the St. Petersburg Grand Prix. But first, we're going to toss it over to Dave Cook in Rome, Italy, to teach us about the ancient origins of STEM. Thanks, Laura. I know you're having fun out at the Grand Prix learning about the STEM of racing, but today I'm here at the Roman Colosseum learning about the origins of STEM. The Roman Colosseum is one of the seven wonders of the world, and STEM is a big reason why. It is one of the largest structures ever built in ancient times, holding more than 50,000 spectators. It's four stories high and still standing after almost 2,000 years and it also attracts four million visitors every year. The architectural design employs arches and columns, and Roman arches essentially made the Roman Empire. The Romans didn't invent this technology, but they just perfected it and did it on a grand scale, like the Colosseum, 
In the design, larger blocks support the weight using engineering to direct the weight load down and out, creating compressive stress in the arch. Meanwhile, the columns were critical to the process, absorbing the compressive load to the ground and a key element in the structural strength. So another great example of STEM genius is here at the Pantheon. Unlike most massive columns, these are made from a solid piece of Egyptian granite. Alaria was born and raised in Rome, and she is our local expert. Usually when we are in front of buildings this big, the columns, the columns are made of blocks. But this temple was so important, being the repeat, dedicated to all of the gods. They believed that the was the best. From the outside, the Pantheon's drum is a massive cylindrical structure that forms the bulk of the monument. The Romans invented and utilized a system of interlocking brick arches, vaults, and piers to enable the drum's even weight distribution and support. And looking inside, the cupola reaches up to the gods and is the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome, which uses lighter materials as it rises. The open-eye oculus reduces the structural load and it is an unmistakable heavenly element in this incredible display of STEM. But it doesn't just end there. And of all the fountains in Rome, this is the most famous, the Trevi Fountain. And you won't believe where this water comes from. The Trevi Fountain is still fed by the ancient Aqua Virgo Aqueduct, part of the famous ancient Roman aqueduct system. Although many modernizations have occurred over the years, it is truly a STEM marvel and one of the most visited sites in Rome. Plus, Rome is famous for more than 2,500 public fresh water fountains all over the ancient part of town, like this one at the Lago di Torre Argentina, the site of Emperor Julius Caesar's death. You'll see Rome citizens drinking and washing from these. The water is clean and safe to drink. Pretty amazing. They say that Rome is like a lasagna, with many different delicious layers, and STEM is just one of them. Science Rocks continues in a moment. We're here at our sixth and seventh grade STEM summer camp, and this year we're introducing some new curriculum, which is drones. Lisa, how do you like teaching the drone curriculum? I love it because it incorporates the coding, which so many of them have learned over the past several years. And it's the coding blocks, different terminologies, but the same concept. And the kids are just mesmerized with this. They love it. They're just big grins on their faces, watching it, wanting to try it again and again and do different things. So for us as STEM Academy teachers and STEM summer camp teachers, how has it impacted you as an instructor? So it's helped me see more ways that coding can be used and more like different projects and how to problem solve different situations because this is completely different than anything we've ever done. So instead of them just flying right off the bat, they're doing something with the computer programming piece. Can you talk about that? So they start off by doing like a hover just to see that it works. So they hover, make sure it works, and then we take them through different lessons to learn the different um, block coding components. So we do a box mission and they're basically just flying in a square and then we're doing adding flips and then we add variables so they can have it do different things within that flight pattern. Ayana, this is our first time using drones in our STEM summer camps. What has this experience been like for you? It's really fun because I've never, I flew on a drone but I've had bad experience doing it. So this is fun to do because you actually can program it to do stuff and you don't have to control it. Matt V, you are a STEM summer camp student. What has your excitement level been like? It's been pretty high. Why? Because of drones, it's quite exciting to do it for the very first time. Now, if this is your first time flying a drone, what are some of the skills that you've learned? You put your hand above it, it's gonna go upwards because it senses like your hand is like the ground. So when you go home every day after STEM summer camps, what are some of the things that you're sharing with your family members? I talk to them about what I learn and I talk to them about how much fun it is here and I really enjoy it. 